I'm sorry, just a second, just a second. So we had quizzers that went yesterday to the district quiz, children's quiz. And so some of them, I think, are on vacation this morning. They left yesterday afterwards. So I'll let Georgia, you take off with it. Good morning. They work really hard. We have five quizzers this year. And like you said, the Flynn family are all on vacation. But yesterday, Isabel got a bronze. And this was Savannah's very first time, and she got a gold. And then Tori and Elijah, they both got a, a gold. And then Brooke, it's her first time, and she got a bronze. And we do quizzing at 5 o'clock on Sunday afternoons if anybody wants to bring their child. We have a lot of fun in there, don't we, guys? All right. over a few pages to 268. Our God reigns, 268.
the Lord. Praise the Lord. Aren't you thankful that our God reigns? Man. Oh, me. Well, it is great to be in the house of the Lord, but what a privilege that we have to be able to come to Him in prayer as well, and that He hears the cry of His children. And so this morning, I would ask all that would like to, to gather in around the altar this morning. We're just going to go to the Lord in prayer. We're going to continue to seek Him. I know we have a lot that are in the hospital and that are sick. And they aren't feeling well, but we serve the God that can touch all of those situations. He can heal and move in every one of those. And so, this morning, we're just going to call out to Him. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, thank You for the day. I thank You, Lord, for how You are continuing to move in our midst. Lord, how You are continuing to speak into our lives. And so, Lord, even this week, as... Maybe the prayer chain had went out about ones who were sick or not feeling well, that were in the hospital. Lord, as we prayed, we continued to hear progress of how you are touching, how you are moving, how you are speaking, how you are healing. And so we give you praise for those things. And so today we even come and we say thank you, Lord, for what you have done. And today we come believing that you're even going to move in a greater way than what you have. Trusting that what you said you will do. That when we are here, you will be right in the midst of us. And so we ask, Lord, just continue to draw us in. Continue, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, to speak into our lives. May we be a people that are willing to allow you to speak into our lives. May we not have offense because you correct us. Because you speak to us, but Lord, may we truly understand how much you do love us. You love us so much that you correct us so that we can live a more holy life for you. To walk in your past, to do as you would have us to do. I pray that today you would just continue, Lord, to help us. I pray, dear Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, though scheduled revival may be over with, may we not be a people that live by a schedule, but we may, may we be a people that live by your word, that live by who you are. May we be a people that don't live on emotion. Too many times we get caught up in the emotional circumstance, in the emotional situation, And we come to church and we try to do the emotional thing. But Lord, Christianity is not about emotion. It's about the relationship that you want to have with us. And so Lord, I pray that this morning that we would not come here looking at different people trying to find the emotion. But may we be a people that come here just looking to you. And when we look to you, you begin to speak to us. And Lord, what we begin to do is we begin to act out through emotion of whatever that may be. Whether it's crying, whether it's raising our hand, whether it's running, whether it's singing. Whatever it is, Lord, we want to be obedient in that. Lord, if you just have us to sit down and just be reverent in your presence, then Lord, may we be obedient in that as well. I ask that today you just continue to draw us close to you. I pray, Lord, for our nation and the time that we are in. I pray, Lord, that a revival would sweep across this nation. But, Lord, before that can ever happen, revival has to happen in the church. And before revival can happen in the church, it has to happen in individual lives. And so, Lord, what I pray for, I pray, Lord, start revival. Start it in me. Lord, may revival spark and may it move in a mighty way. May it flow through this church, to this community. May it move across this state. And dear Heavenly Father, Lord, may it move across the country. Lord, we need you more than we've ever needed you before. You're the same God yesterday and today and forever. May we continue to run to you. 
I ask, Lord, that you just continue to be with us through the remainder of this service. Once again, may we just continue to hear your voice. May we be obedient. When your spirit speaks, may we listen. Draw us close to you today. Thank you for all that you have done, but Lord, also what you're going to do. We trust you in those things. Give strength where it is needed. Heal the brokenhearted. Set the prisoner free. Lord, that's what you came to do. Lord, you did it, but you're still doing it. And so today, Lord Jesus, may your word continue to go forth. We love you and we praise you for all that you do. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. Mm. It's an awesome movie of the Holy Spirit. I see his countenance resting on each face. I know that there. the presence of the Lord is in this place. Is
Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Mm. He is here. He is here. Amen. Yeah, sure. Right, right. Amen. 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 That's right. Yeah, amen, amen, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, that's what he does for us, man, mm. well if you have your Bibles with you, the, the kids will be in the service with us today, the first uh, Sunday of the month, but I promise, it's going to be okay. Jeremiah 34 is where I will be at this morning. Jeremiah chapter 34. And after you have found the book of Jeremiah chapter 34, if you would stand out of reverence of God's word. Jeremiah chapter 34. We'll be starting in verse 8. The word of the Lord says this. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord after King Zedekiah had made a covenant with all the people in Jerusalem to make a proclamation of liberty to them that everyone should set free his Hebrew slaves, male and female, so that no one should enslave a Jew, his brother. Verse 10. And they obeyed. All the officials and all the people who had entered into the covenant that everyone would set free his slave, male or female, so that they would not be enslaved again. They obeyed and set them free. But afterward they turned around and took back the male and female slaves they had set free and brought them into subjection as slaves. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Verse 13, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel... I myself made a covenant with your fathers when I brought them out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of slavery, saying, At the end of seven years, each of you must set free the fellow Hebrew who has been sold to you and has served you six years. You must set him free from your service. But your fathers did not listen to me or incline their ears to me. You, recent, you recently repented and did what was right in my eyes by proclaiming liberty, each to his neighbor, and you made a covenant before me in the house that is called by my name. But then you turned around and profaned my name when each of you took back his male and female slaves, whom you had set free according to their desire, and brought them into subjection to be your slaves. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, I ask would you just continue to help us this morning, because you are here. 
Sometimes your response to us is this, are we here? And so, Lord, I pray, would you touch us today? Draw us ever close to you. And, Lord, we're going to give you praise for all that you do. Would you help me, Lord, as I preach your word? May you hide me behind the cross. May you anoint me with the power of your spirit. May it not be anything that I have done, but, Lord, may you get glory in everything that is said and done. We give you praise for these things. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, this morning, I'd like for the kids to come up. So if all the kids want to come up, I've got a surprise for you. That you all can... No, Hank, I'm sorry. Oh, wait, sorry. So if the kids want to come up, I've got a surprise. And so you all can pick a surprise out. So I've got, I've got girls... In this bag, you can just put, well, no, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, just one. Hey, that's good thinking. Give me a high five on that one. That's good. Just pick one out of there if you would. Just pick you one thing out. I promise you'll like it. Oh, yeah. You just pick you one out of there. I, I promise you like it. If you don't, blame somebody else. So, okay, okay. You pick you something out of this one. You pick you something out of that one. I'll reach in there and grab one. Oh, yeah. That's what I'm talking about. You reach in there and grab one. There you go. Reach in there and get you something. You're welcome. You're welcome. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. All right. All right. Get you one. Get you one. You see anything in there you think you like? Okay. Uh, that's like a, uh, oh, if you grab it here and you pull it, it's going to shoot up in there like crazy. It's like a rocket. Okay, you're doing that. Okay. All right. We'll switch up here. Here you go. You all get to pick out of this one. Just grab you one out of there. <laughs> all right, there you go. You pick you one out of there. Grab you something. All right, there you go. Hey, that's that's all right. That's no problem. She's good. Hey, you want to pick something? Here you go. You want to pick something out? Yeah, you see it. You're looking in there. Ha ha! She got us. She got us. So did. You want to pick you something out? Well, yeah. You're on national TV. How do you like it? <laughs> all right. Is that it? Is that it? Is that all of them? All right. Oh, does, does she want some? Does he want some? There you go. There you go. Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, she did that too. So I, I thought that would be nice to do, and uh, that way they could have something there. They're in here with us today. Um, well, you know what? Uh, if you would, all the kids, just bring those back up to me. I'm so, I must have made a mistake. No, I mean, if you would, y'all just y'all bring them back up. Just put them back in the bag for me. So, uh, and they, uh, come on, bring them back up here. I'm so we just they're still laughing. No, come on, come on. Come on. <laughs> oh, man. Now, now, some of them kind of got a little bit nervous on that part there with this whole thing of it. You see, this morning I'm going to preach a message that's just entitled, No Take Backs. No Take Backs. So, see, for me to give that to them and then want to take it back, well, that's just not very nice, is it? <laughs> Trick them in that sense that they were actually going to get something, but it was only just for a little short time and then just to bring it back and say, no, you just got to look at it, maybe even touch it for a minute, maybe play with it for just one time, but you all can keep those, I promise. Just leave $5 in the bag when you I'm just joking, I'm just joking. So, oh, me. Well, this morning we get into a passage of Scripture in Jeremiah chapter 34. And with the book of Jeremiah, a lot of times we look at the book of Jeremiah and we think, man, this old prophet... And he comes in, what in the world is he doing preaching all these crazy, man, that's just, that's harsh. Can I tell you a little bit about the prophet Jeremiah? He started prophesying before he was 20 years old. God sent him to the people and says, I need you to talk to them. That's the reason if you were to go to Jeremiah chapter 1, Jeremiah argues with the Lord a little bit in verse 6. In verse 6, Jeremiah says this, O oh Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a youth. 
Now, then, he wasn't making excuses. Really, he was just a youth. He was a teenager. Some scholars even go back to say he started at 17. Is when he started prophesying to the people. Now, take in context some of the things that we have that the Lord spoke through the prophet to the people that had been around, some of them four times longer than he had been alive. Oh, now grab a hold of that. I had somebody tell me one time, they said, well, I just don't think that I could ever come to your church. I've never had a pastor that was younger than me. <laughs> Unless everybody dies pretty quick, somebody eventually is going to have a pastor that is younger than what you are, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, But the thing of it is this. Think about Jeremiah coming in. They're going into captivity, and he is the one that's proclaiming it. Can you imagine this 19-year-old boy? Going into all these people, man, he's just flat out laying it out. God spoke to him, and so that is what he would do. You see, Jeremiah prophesied what God would speak to him. And with this, now grab a hold of it for just a second. With what God spoke through Jeremiah and what Jeremiah spoke, he went against the establishment. You say the establishment? Yeah, you know that word that we like to use. He went against the establishment. Now, I'm not talking about the establishment of God, the establishment of His Word and His laws. I'm talking about the establishment of everything that man made up. Oh, that's easy to do. You see, the thing that Jeremiah had to walk into was, he was walking into people that says, we'll do it our way, thank you, we know best. You know what that's considered? That's considered the establishment. Every church has it, because every church thinks that they have it, at least one or two people, We've got it down. You know what you're called? The establishment. Not established on God's word, but it's established on what you feel is going to be best for the church. And Jeremiah had to go against the establishment. You see, the establishment was the reason that they were in the place that they were in. The establishment was the reason that they got caught up and was going to have to go into captivity. And so here Jeremiah would come in and start saying these things. At the age of 19, some of these words were pretty harsh to a lot of these people. But realize this, if you can, Jeremiah didn't prophesy for a year or two years or three years, and then they voted him out, and they got a new one in to prophesy. <laughs> uh, Jeremiah was in for the long haul. And not only was Jeremiah in for the long haul, so were the people. And so all of a sudden, the people are saying, Here's a, I mean, think about it. You're going into captivity. Where else are you going to run? You've already run from the one that actually had the answer. And so when you run from the one that has the answer, he has to send another one into the place that you're at to give you the answer that you should have got to start with. That way you wouldn't be in the place that you're at. Does that sound like a lot of people's lives? It's like all we do is we do this circle. You know what that's called? Exodus. <laughs> Instead of going straight to the promised land, let's wander around. Let's wander around until we say, oh, you know what? He actually, God had this right. Too many times we find ourselves in this place. So Jeremiah would continue to prophesy to the people year after year, day after day. He would have these words that he would speak. You can see a lot of times the reason that the scripture would call Jeremiah the weeping prophet. Can you imagine getting a word from the Lord, having to speak it to people that are a lot older than you are and them not wanting to change because they still think they've got it figured out? Oh, you never had to do that? What about if you were to reverse that? A parent continually trying to tell a child that, no, I'm telling you, this is not the best way to do it because we've already been down that road and it doesn't work out good, and yet the child continues to say, no, I know best. Oh, that's ringing a bell with a lot more people, right? You do realize that all of us were in that spot at one time. Yeah. Oh, it's just sometimes it is the other way around. <laughs> so he continues to tell them to repent. To re By the way, Jeremiah is full of repentance. By the way, the Old Testament is full of repentance. By the way, the New Testament. Oh, wait, hang on. By the way, this whole thing is talking about repentance. Because the only way to make it to heaven is if you repent. You can't get there just by knowing who Jesus is or knowing what God is or knowing even what the Word is. You've got to repent to be able to get there. So he continues to do this. 
And today we're going to pick up in chapter 34. So in chapter 34, I'll go ahead and fast forward it to you from his time of 19 years old to now he is at the place of 39 years that he has been doing this faithfully. Faithfully proclaiming the word of God. Jeremiah is now 58 years old. He has been prophesying to the people that they made the wrong turn, they chose the wrong thing, captivity is coming for 34 years, I mean for 39 years. So at the age of now 58, we pick up in chapter 34. We pick up in where Jeremiah begins to talk about some of the things that were going to happen, and verse 8 is very clear. Realize this, that after 39 years, nothing has changed from what has changed at the first, and you say, yeah, I know the people just didn't get it. No, 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 don't miss out on the part that's really important. The part that's really important is in verse 8 that really goes all the way back to chapter 1. That goes back to the time that God called Jeremiah out, which says this, The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Thirty-nine years. Jeremiah had been faithful, not to say what he wanted to say, but to say what God wanted him to say. Thirty-nine years. Can you imagine thirty-nine years beating your head into a wall? Can you imagine 39 years beaten against the establishment that still thinks that they know best, even though the word revealed through the prophet says, no, you missed it, and the establishment still says, no, we're going to say you're wrong until we just can't say it anymore. Oh, man, look at where Jeremiah's at. Jeremiah right there with them. It ain't like Jeremiah went home. Jeremiah was in the same place they were. And so here we see this man begin to prophesy to them once again. Verse 8, the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. I am so thankful that the Lord still speaks. That we are not living in a thing that we would call the silent era or the dark ages of 400 years of God not speaking. But yet, for each one of us, we can have the Lord speak to us directly. He wants to call us out into a deeper walk with Him, to a deeper relationship with Him. To actually do away with the establishment that we made on our own. You do realize the reason a lot of people struggle with this aspect of salvation and repentance is because of their own establishment. We want to say, no, no, it's all Adam and Eve's fault. Well, Adam and Eve started it, but we still got to take responsibility. We're called the establishment even ourselves. I know we don't like to swallow that part of it. It's always somebody else's fault. Because that's what the United States of America has taught us to say. That's the reason you have a lawyer that's on every corner. That's willing to sue even your grandmother. <laughs> if you'd like to do that. If you don't believe me, just watch the commercials. They're out there. Verses 8 and 9 goes on to say there at the end of verse 8. That what he had begun to do is that the king of Zedekiah had made this covenant with the people. And he says, what I need you to do is I need you to make sure that you have this proclamation of liberty that is going to be given to them. That they're going to be able to do what needs to be done. That everyone needs to be set free that was a Hebrew slave. So if you were to have bought that Hebrew as a slave, that after those six years, the seventh year, now they're going to be free. You're going to make them free. And so King Zedekiah had already done that. He had made sure that they realized that this proclamation was set in place. You see, if you were to go back, God instituted all this, the true establishment, right? God's the true establishment. And so all of a sudden we go back and we realize that, man, we've heard something about this proclamation of liberty. We've heard something about this six years and then the seventh year, they're set free. No longer having to be there because if we were to go back to Exodus chapter 21, that's what God says. After he led the people out, he made all the laws for them and says, now this is what you're supposed to do. And one of those was this. If you have a slave, after those six years that they have labored for you, you set them free on the seventh. You make sure that they're able to say, you know what? Oh, whew, I'm done with this. Praise the Lord. Here we go. And you're supposed to say, okay. Thank you for your service that you did for me. Now you're free. This proclamation of liberty. But if you were to go just a little bit further, you'd get into Leviticus chapter 25. In Leviticus chapter 25, there's a, a three-term uh, words that are used there that would be the year of Jubilee. And so the year of Jubilee is even really, if we were to think about it, we even celebrate that even today. 
It's something that comes around. It'd be every 50 years is what it would be. So what it would take, it would take these six years of being in captivity, but that seventh year be free. And then on the seventh time, the seventh, on that 50th year, all of a sudden, guess what? Everything's free. Land's free. Cattle are free. People are free. Everything is set free. Just think if you were to done a 51-year mortgage instead of a 30, maybe on the 50th year, they'd just let it go, the rest of it go free. Now, we only said on 30. See, they were pretty smart. They did 30 years. That way they wouldn't have to. Ah, okay. Well, whatever. But anyway, so here we are. We have this year of Jubilee instituted by God that this 50th year is going to be a year that they would celebrate. Man, that they, not only these people, but the people that have been held in captivity. Even the animals, the land, everything would have this year of jubilee. So this proclamation of liberty is what Zedekiah gave to them. This is what the Lord had already put in place. Zedekiah was just to make sure that this was supposed to be carried out. But the problem was it hadn't been in the past. They kind of walked away from the things of God. They thought that they knew what was best, what would be the greatest. And so they just kind of bypassed all of that. And here we see this part of it. And then when Zedekiah makes this in verse 10, it says they obeyed. I mean, it was like just like that. He made the proclamation of liberty and the people were like, oh, we remember now. We remember that. They, it just slipped my mind. Six years, seventh year, go free. Seven, that, that's good. Zedekiah, king, we're with you. We're with you. Let's do that because that's what the scripture says. All the officials and all the people entered into that covenant with King Zedekiah. And so here they are. They get into this place. They, they said, we're going to do this part. We're not going to enslave you again. Key words. Enslave again. Right? Because that's what verse 10 says. They came in agreement with that part of it. They said, yeah, we're willing to do this, King Zedekiah. Set them free. Never to be enslaved again. And so as they begin to obey that, as they begin to follow that, as they begin to do that, the last part of verse 10 is very important. Because the very last sentence of verse 10 says this, they obeyed and set them free. Whew. Now let's close that up go home. I'm going to pray. <laughs> they obeyed. And set them free. Did y'all grab hold of everybody? Y'all did hear that. I'm not just making that up. You got your Bible out and you realize what it says too. Verse 10, very last sentence. They obeyed and set them free. They obeyed and set them free. That's awesome. Man, is it that easy? Right? They obeyed and set them free. Evidently for the people, that's what they did. They just said, whoo, we are going to do this. The king has ordained that. We realize this. God instituted it way back when. We're going to continue to be these people. We're willing to do that part of it. As they obeyed and set them free, we would get all excited just like the ones who were enslaved would get all excited. Watch this. The ones who were enslaved, man, they're like, whoo, it's about time. You ever been that person? Boy, it's about time somebody stood up for me. It's about time somebody did the right thing. It's about time they read the little fine print because they've been missing it the whole time. You ever mean? Am I the only one that thinks that? Right? Man, they finally got it. Never to be enslaved again. Man, they get all excited. Verse 11, though. Man, why do we have to have verse 11? Because in verse 11, all of a sudden, we begin to get to this point, And verse 11 says this. But afterward, they turned around and took back. Y'all did read the end of verse 10, right? They obeyed and set them free. And it's almost like we couldn't even have a breath in reading. Before it says, they turned around and took back the male female slaves. They had set free and brought them once again into subjection as slaves. You know how hard it is to fight against the establishment? Once again, I'm not talking about the Lord. People fight against the Lord all the time, think they won. But human establishment, most people aren't willing to fight against that. Most people aren't willing to do anything about that because what they say is, well, that's the establishment. Well, based on what? 
So if you were to come into a church or you were to go to a church and all of a sudden you realize that maybe 1, 2, 12, 50, 7, whatever it is, kind of ran the church, ran the way things went, you would call that the establishment, though you may not say it the way that I'm saying it, but that's what you would say, right? And maybe you wouldn't proclaim it from the pulpit, but probably behind closed doors or on the telephone. <laughs> that would never happen for sure. But anyway... All of a sudden you see this part of it and you realize it's establishment. But the thing about it is this, most people won't fight against the establishment. Not the real establishment because we're willing to walk again. We'll fight against the Lord, the author of the establishment. Yet when it comes to the aspect of having to deal with things, we'd rather allow the human establishment to just do whatever they do. It's just not controversial. We don't have to deal with it if we do that. Did, did you realize that if you don't deal with the establishment, then a verse 11 always happens? <laughs> hang on! Hang on! Some crazy preacher comes in, preaches a verse 10, everybody gets excited, but we just forgot that. And then all of a sudden, before you know it, did you realize the establishment can go to a verse 11? And yet they turned around and they once again did what, you know what, you know the reason is, don't you? Because they thought that they were an establishment way too long. We call it sometimes like this. They've been in authority way too long. They've been in power way too long. And you do realize that more power and more authority equals a bigger head. And a bigger head equals harder to deal with. And harder to deal with means that eventually everything just shuts down. Okay, well, I don't know if you know that or not. But I'm just going to go ahead and give you the update. That's what happens. <laughs> And so here, this is what we see begins to happen with them. A fight against the establishment of what God truly said needs to happen versus what the people said we will do. Okay, moving on. <laughs> Woo! Verses 12 through 14, look at these real quick. 12 through 14, once again, it's very clear where this comes from. The Lord once again revealing himself to Jeremiah. The Lord speaking through Jeremiah. The Lord just being a willing 58-year-old prophet to hear what the Lord has said, to go once again and beat his head against the establishment. And he said, yeah, I'll, I'll do it. I'll do it. Lord, you called me out. You said that you already had this plan, and this is what you wanted me to do. I'm willing to do it. And so Jeremiah continues to do that. The word of the Lord comes to Jeremiah. He goes back to the original establishment. So if you were to look at verses 12 through 14 right there, thus says the Lord, I made a covenant with your fathers when I brought them out. So now guess what it is? It goes all the way back to Exodus and Leviticus. What God said was this. Yeah, I, I'd already put that in between. Now, Jeremiah, you need to, once again, because they thought they had it, but they didn't have it because they went ahead and did their own thing after they said they had it. Verse 10, verse 11. And so what happens is this. God says, now Jeremiah, I don't want you to beat a dead horse, so I'm going to speak through you, and I'll beat the dead horse. <laughs> right? Let, make sure you're not beating the person. Hello? You better make sure you're filled with the Holy Spirit, because if you're not filled with the Holy Spirit trying to do it, then you are beating the dead person, or beating the dead horse. Dead person. <laughs> I'm sorry. Anyway, we get to this point. And so Jeremiah says through the power of the Lord, hey, guess what? I made all this covenant with your fathers. I made it with them. I did it with them. They said that they were going to obey. But then guess what happens? God points it out. God points it out so much that he says in the end of verse 14, but your fathers did not listen to me or incline their ears to me. They said that they had it figured out. They said they were willing to do it. But they would not incline their ears to me. They wouldn't even listen. They wouldn't even, what he says is, they wouldn't give me the time of day. How's your time of day been with the Lord? Because I'll tell you this, God's vying for it. Because he's the one that created the time. <laughs> and so if he created the time, I think that we actually probably need to give him a little bit of it. Right? And so all of a sudden we see this part. And we see how they come into this part of it. That God says, Jeremiah, they need to realize they're not the establishment. 
They need to realize they're not in charge. They need to realize they're not the one that says what goes. I am. And I already put it into their forefathers, and their forefathers rejected me. The reason that you're in the place that you're in now, now you need to tell them that, Jeremiah. They need to realize that the reason that they end up in the shape that they're in is because they would not listen to my word. Now, what he's saying is this. Mama and daddy and grandmother and granddad and grandparents and great and great and great and great, how far you want to go. Sometimes what the Lord comes in and has to reveal to us is this. Because you weren't willing to do the right thing, now all of a sudden the whole church is in captivity, yet we wouldn't agree with that whatsoever because we'd say, no, no, it's not, I can do that and it ain't going to affect nobody. Well, show me that in Scripture. You better believe what you do affects this church because if you say that you're part of the body of Christ and you do something opposite of the body of Christ, it affects the body of Christ. Oh, yeah, it's going to get deeper. It's going to get deeper. I'm just saying that's where it's at. We want to claim Christianity. We want to claim the building. But truly, when it comes down to it, we're not part of the body of Christ because we're doing things opposite the body of Christ. And so you can't do things opposite the body of Christ and claim the body of Christ. God says, no, 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 I cut you off and I throw you in the fire. That's, that's Jesus' teaching. So then all of a sudden we look at this. Now God is saying this in the Old Testament. He's coming through and he's making a way and he's trying to get them to understand. He's trying to help them out. Now here's the thing. We read through this and we just don't see it with much emotion. We don't see it that Jeremiah would really preach that hard. Because when people are filled with the Holy Spirit and they're going to prophesy like this, I mean they're just real laid back. Jesus was when he went into the temple. He went in and actually turned the tables over like this. Hang on just a second. Oh, no, I just don't know if I can get somebody come help me. Oh, uh, yeah, no, no. And then Jesus, what Jesus said was, just move this off, scatter some on the table, and then we're doing it. That's not what the Scripture says. <laughs> now, we want to read it that way because we think that the God that created all the emotions never uses those emotions. And if we think that that's true, then we don't know the Old Testament nor the New Testament. Now, watch this. Jesus comes on the scene, he makes it very clear what needs to happen. All the ones who would write later on uh, the Gospels that we have, and then even a little bit further back, we've got to realize that we are angry and sin not. So realize this, there's no way that Jesus could have went into the temple, turned over the table, and sinned. But he sure was upset. Because he can't contradict himself. Because the scripture says there was no sin in him. He couldn't have died on the cross if there was sin. Why? Because he did something that we could not do. He was sinless. So understand this part of it, that when we read Scripture, you better believe that there's a part of God that is angry. He gets angry. He gets upset. He gets mad. He gets these things. You say, well, why is that? Why? Number one, God hates sin. God hates sin. There is no place in Scripture where you're going to say where God just tolerates sin. No, no, he doesn't. God does not tolerate sin. I don't care if it's in your family. I don't care if it's your child. I don't care if it's your spouse. God will not sit back on the day of judgment and say, well, I know they're related to you. Everything's good. Boy, we want it. That's what we wish for. I think we pray more like that than what we actually pray for them to get right with the Lord. I think what we're saying is this, Lord, can, can they just ride my coattail to heaven? I'm going to do the best I can. No, they can't. So if they don't straighten up, get right with the Lord, quit their sinning, then they don't get to go to heaven. Well, we just can't say it like that. Well, good thing that you're not Jeremiah. <laughs> you see, some people, God can't fill with the Spirit to be able to preach it because we're too scared to preach it. We're afraid what the establishment might think about it. We're afraid that the establishment might say it's time to move on. We're afraid that the establishment might say we may cut your pay. We're afraid that the establishment might say you can't work here anymore. But really what needs to happen is we need to forget about what establishment thinks that they established themselves because anybody that establishes themselves outside of who God is is not an establishment. And so all of a sudden we see here and God begins to speak through that. And he says, your forefathers didn't listen to me either. The reason you're here is because of this reason. Verse 15. Verse 15, all of a sudden, now watch what he does. He went back in time to bring it back home. What? Did you get that? He went back in time to bring it back home. Watch verse 15. Verse 15 starts out like this. You recently repented. Oh, did y'all get that? Re that doesn't mean that it was 12 years ago. That doesn't mean that it was when he was 19 and just started. That means literally 
It ain't been no time. And you just recently repented, verse 15. And it says this, and did what was right in my eyes. Now watch. Now listen, this is God still speaking. This is not Jeremiah. This is the Lord speaking to the people. So what God admits is this. You came down and you repented. Then you did what was right based on what I told you that you needed to do. And man, can you see? I believe God was excited about that. People did the right thing. That's what he says. You recently repented and did what was right in my eyes by proclaiming liberty each to his neighbor. And you made a covenant before me. Now listen, if we really wanted to get into the covenant, it talks about it even a little bit more. But you would talk about the covenant in this way. You'd get a bull and then they would come together. And what would happen is you would cut the bull in half. Now watch. You cut the bull in half and set it apart and all the blood and everything. And you walk through it. You walk through it. That's talking about a covenant. So I don't know about many of us today. Josh, am I coming over? You're going to cut one down? I mean, you just walk right through it, buddy. That's right. So you look, you're looking at this thing. Man, it's interesting if we were to get a little bit deeper into what that covenant truly means and what it really foreshadowed and what it really has for us today, then we'd understand that actually the Old Testament is more pertinent than what we give it credit for in our lives today. And so all of a sudden we look at this. And really what I believe verse 15 kind of says here, God says it in this way. Don't you remember? (laughs) It was just the other day. Don't you? It was just recently. You repented. Did that slip your mind that quick? Did, Did what you, what you did and really how you felt about it, didn't that make you feel good to do the right thing when I spoke? Right? When, when God moved and, and he said, well, what happened? You did all those things. You did the right thing. You made the covenant before me to do these things. Now, verse 16, watch what he says. Verse 16, it's very important because he says this. But then you turned around. Oh, man. What God said was this. You did it right. You actually got it. You made the covenant with me. You recently did that. And then by the end, verse 16, it says, but then you turned around. You turned around. You went the other direction. (laughs) You you were coming toward me. You were doing the right thing. I had spoken. You realized that you all had missed it. You understood what your forefathers did was not right. And you all wanted to do the right thing. And then all of a sudden he says, no, no. Then you turned around, but he didn't stop with that. He says, but then you turned around, and the very next part is this, and profaned my name. Oh, Now, that word right there is very interesting, that word profaned. Very interesting in how it's used right here. Of what God would begin to say to the people who just recently did the right thing. Who just recently had grabbed hold of it. You see, it's a Hebrew word that means to defile. Now, wait a minute. We, we don't use the words accordingly enough when we read it or when we're telling someone about Scripture because we water it down. That way it doesn't have its bad effect. We feel that if we were to read the word for really what it is, it would actually hurt people so bad that they wouldn't want anything of the Lord. Satan's good at that. Oh, don't, don't say that to them. That's going to hurt their feelings. I'm glad Jeremiah didn't listen to anybody saying it was going to hurt somebody's feelings and what he did. It means to defile. It means to violate the honor of, to just completely dishonor. Now watch this. The other way that it's used, to make common. Uh Uh-oh. Boy, now listen, they would have known what it meant. When Jeremiah said that word, they may have missed everything else, but they wouldn't have missed the word profane in the way that he used it in the Hebrew that meant to make common, which what it means is this. It goes against everything that the Ten Commandments actually say. It goes against everything that the first four says. It goes against everything that the first one said, that God says this is number one. And what Jeremiah said was this. You all... He's looking at the people, and he says, you all 
have made my name just as common as anything else. You might as well be serving the bells. You might as well put somebody, you might as well have your establishment come back up because that's what you just did. Now, now I'll tell you this, now that would have cut them. Because all of a sudden you look at this, and man, they remember the story of Exodus. They remember the story of the Ten Commandments. They remember the story of Moses. But then when he gets to this part and he talks about this profaning his name. And he says, now I'm not going to leave you to wonder about the time that you profaned my name. God goes ahead and makes sure that you understand, right? This is what God does. He comes into our lives, and God doesn't do generalities. You see, a lot of preachers want to preach in generality. That way it doesn't hurt anybody. God doesn't do that. God's a personal God. And so what happens is this. Even in the Old Testament, God would speak through the prophets, and you get to a point that's just like this in verse 16 of chapter 34, and he says, You profane my name when each of you took back his male and female slaves whom you had set free according to their desire. Now listen, he says, you know when you did it wrong? When you came in and said that you did something that you didn't mean because recently you repented, but then you turned back and went just the other direction. Now, my question is going to be this, as David and Dustin come on up here in just a minute. My question is going to be this. How much have you taken back? You see, I started out with no take backs. See, it wouldn't have been very nice for me to take back from all the kids of things that I just gave. But the thing is this, how many times do we give God something and we take it back? And God's saying, well, I thought there was no take backs. <laughs> uh, no, the thing of it is this, you still got free will just like I do. And so when we come to the altar and we begin to pray about things and things begin to weigh on us and we begin to deal with those and we realize that we put it off way too long or how about even this we realize that there's sin in the family of generation after generation that needs to be broken and God is dealing with us to break that and then we come down and we repent and we say Lord we're sorry for that we don't want to do that anymore and all of a sudden we get back up how recently do we turn I wish I could tell you how many people I prayed with that I really believe they got it. But it wasn't too long after that. They turned. Now watch this. And when they turned, it wasn't just a turning around. It was a profaning of God's name. Because we come to an altar. We go to our prayer closet. We pray in our car. We pray over our family. We pray over our job. And all of a sudden, after we do all those things, we still turn and think we're the establishment. And we still say, Lord, I think I know what's best for my life. I think I know what's best in this situation. I think I know what's best in this relationship. Lord, I think I know what really, Lord, I'm the establishment. Even though we realize what the Word of God says. See, I think... There's a lot of people in here, that, right? You know what the Word of God says. You know it. But I wonder also how many people, even this week, revival was good. Maybe you got some help. My question is this. It's only been about four days since we ended. How recently? How recently? See, we think about these things and we look at this and all of a sudden we want to take back all the things we've given to the Lord. And we want to say, Lord, yeah, I know, but I just have to have it. You ever had that conversation with the Lord? No, Lord, you just don't understand. I really need this. Lord, you just don't understand. That's the thing that's got me through. Lord, you just don't understand. If I don't have that, I just don't think that I can live. Oh, boy. You see, here's what I would say. I'd say it like this. Because I'm not for sure about this part of slavery. We don't own slaves today. We don't do that sort of thing. But the things that we do that would come home to the 21st century, that would come home to our nation, 
that would come home to our state, that would come home to our county, that would come home to a city, that would come home to a church, that would come home to our homes. You see, God's not a God of generalities. God is a personal God. And here's the thing. You can run as long as you want to run. But he'll never change to a God of generalities. It's always personal. You see, don't give God your child and then take them back. Now watch this. Watch this. Don't give God your child either when they're a baby, when they're in the womb, when they get a little older, when they become an adult, when they do this. Now what? Don't give God your child and then take them back. Now watch this. Don't give God your child, and because they do something bad or they wander off from where they want to be, you try to take it back. They're still God's if you gave them to them. It's not yours anymore. No take backs. No take backs. Too many times what we do is we do this. Well, Lord, you just don't understand. My child, is, and Lord, you, don't, you know what you're saying? I'm the establishment. I know better than the one who actually created everything. The true establishment. Oh, come on. Listen, don't take back your child when everything starts to go good. Oh, come on. Come on. You see, that happens. We run to church when something goes wrong, but as soon as it starts to get better, I'll take that back now. I I'll have that. Thank you for getting me out of that mess, but everything's good right now. I think I'll do it myself. Don't give God your marriage and then take it back. Don't give God, don't stand before God Almighty and all of a sudden hold hands with your spouse and have the preacher repeat something that you don't mean. <laughs> now you see why I ain't married too many people. But anyway, <laughs> the thing is this. We take too flippant in the things that we say we give God. Lord, I give you my child. Really? No take back. Lord, I give you my marriage. Really? No take backs. I'm pretty sure, I don't know if they still say it, for better, for worse. Oh, yeah, I know. That's just, that's Old Testament. That's Old Testament. That's just something in there that, even, that we don't understand that Jesus spoke very highly of what marriage is. Because marriage gives us the ability to see our marriage between him and us. We got marriage all mixed up. We think it's between man and woman. But if you've been enlightened, you know that marriage is between Jesus and the church. Jesus and his bride. This just helps us to see what spiritual things are all about. Oh, boy, man, that hit it whole. I don't know. Evidently, we've never got that deep before, so Wednesday night, we'll be talking. No, I'm just joking. So anyway, here we go. Don't give God, listen, don't give God your job if you think you're going to take it back. Don't give it to him. What's the use in giving somebody something and then turn around and taking it back? We're no better than what they were in the Old Testament. No take backs. We say we trust God, yet we don't give him None of our time. We say we trust God, yet we wouldn't give him our child. We wouldn't give him our house. We wouldn't give him anything else that we have. We wouldn't give him our family because we think we know best. Yet what we'll say when we come to church is, I trust God. Well, how much have you done in trusting God that you believe that God can help the situation? Well, I mean, I pray for at least two or three minutes. Some of y'all are like, well, I just don't. Well, listen, I'm just telling you. I know your families. So if your family's in a mess... Here's the thing. I'll hold you accountable. Would you like me to call you and ask you how long you've been praying for them? How long you've been on your knees? Oh, you want to send me a message and have me pray for them? But can I just tell you this? Now, you're going to be upset about it. But I'll tell you this. If you come here and you give me a prayer request that you ain't prayed about, take it back home. Because you need to pray about it. If you're going to bring it, you better pray about it. Well, I, just know, I think it's the job of the church. God's a personal God. And we want to bring everything else to somebody else to have them do it. And we just kind of sit back on our sofa and try to enjoy the fruit of something that we didn't even labor for. Oh, man, I've hit a brick wall so big that you all wouldn't even believe in. Woo! 
Here's the thing. Don't give God your life and then try to take it back. Lord, I give you everything. I want you to. And two days later, back in the same mess that you're in. Don't give God your life if all you're saying is, I just want to feel better for right now. Remember, God's not an emotional God. Listen, Christianity is not about emotion. So if you're trying to ride some emotional high to get to heaven, you probably ain't going to make it. <laughs> oh, boy, it's tough this morning, but I didn't expect anything different. So you know, my thing is this, what have you given to God and taken back? Because we'll sit here and we'll say, no, I'm holier, I'm holier, I'm holier. So here's my thing. I, I've got a, I got a message that I am going to preach sometime. You know what it's titled? The title's just two words. It's titled this. Prove it. If you're going to open your mouth and say it, then you've got to prove it. If you're going to say that this is you, then you're going to have to prove it. Because guess what? I'm from the show me state. I'm from Missouri. I want to see it. I don't want lip service. I don't want people telling me. You know why? Because, man, lip service gets church in trouble. Lip service hurts the body of Christ. Lip service means we come in here and we say, oh, we're doing good and everything else. And yet, really, when you go out, man, it's a mess. Your life's a mess. Work's a mess. Job's a mess. Home's a mess. Children are a mess. Family's a mess. And yet, we try to come in and say, wah, 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 wah. no, 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 no. How much have we took back? God says, you know what it's about time? It's about time that you come down and don't take anything back. It's time you come down and you just leave it here. It's time you come down and you really trust me for the God that I am. I'm the establishment, he says. Trust me. Because I'll tell you, I can work it out. 